called to order. Elena, will you please do our Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, for us to get started, I would like to see a motion to either adopt or amend the agenda as listed. Second. All right, it's been first and seconded. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Seeing no objections, it has been adopted. That takes us on to our awards and recognitions, and to do that, I will turn it over to Dr. Adrian Battle. a couple of great groups of team MPS staff members to celebrate tonight so I'm going to jump right in so when the distress calls from the Covenant School started coming in on the morning of March 27th our team quickly jumped into action to do anything we could to support our neighbors and help them in a time of crisis our people move with speed and skill and great care and compassion to try to make an unspeakably difficult situation just the slightest bit easier to manage they drove buses to get students and staff to the reunification site so they could be with their families again. They provided security support on the ground and took calls from concerned parents and community members here at the support hub. And they offered counseling services to anyone who needed help at the site. These acts of kindness and service can go a long way in a moment of tragedy. And I'm very grateful to and extremely proud of these MMPS staff members for going the extra mile that day. So I have a few groups I want to thank. As I call your names, please come to the front and then we'll take a group photo at the end. First, we have our bus drivers who provided a sense of safety and calm for hundreds of Covenant School students and staff members. Those drivers are Steve Bowman, Kelly Bell, come on up to the front if y'all don't mind, Sandra Cobble, Dwayne Farrell, Tracy Garton, Dee Dee Helms, Alberta Houston, Nicole Ross, Maurice Southall, Martha Suarez, George Thomas, Christina Wade, Tania Williams, Tracy Williams, and Gary Woodard. Let's give them all a round. I'll go anywhere yet. I have a few more of your teammates I would like to recognize as well. So from our safety and security, we have dispatcher Latanya Yarlett, who calmly, efficiently, and helpfully answer phone calls throughout the day from concerned parents and other community members, along with three security leaders who went to the reunification reunif site to help. So Latanya, make sure you come on up. Um, also, we'd like to recognize Reginald Young, our Executive Director of Safety and Security, Ruben Dobson, Manager of School Security, and Jonathan Hathaway, Supervisor of School Security. Let's give them a round of applause as well. And everyone stay put. Um, from our counseling and social work departments, we have two leaders who also went to the reunification site to offer support and services to anyone who needed help processing the terrible events of the morning. So we'd like to recognize Dr. Joe Gordon, coordinator of school counseling South, and Dr. Monica Coverson, director of social work and trauma-informed schools. They put. <laughs> because although we could not honor all of them individually tonight, we have more than 50 school counselors, social workers, school psychologists, trauma-informed specialists, and others who fan out to our schools in the Green Hills area for the rest of that week to provide support to the students and staff in those buildings. And we appreciate them so much. Let's have another big round of applause for all team MPS members who helped out immediately after the tragedy.
And we're so very proud of the work um, that you do and um, just the tremendous um, effort that you put in on that day and every day um, on behalf of MNPS in Nashville. So everyone, come on up. We'd love to get a group photo um, with you all to celebrate you live and in action. So come on up. Our heroes. Thank you again, and just thank you for representing MMPS so well. So again, thank you to all of our first responders. Um, I'm also excited this evening to celebrate a group of teachers who have proven they're at the top of their game. So National Board Certification is a professional endorsement of accomplished teaching practice. The endorsement is awarded by the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards. This certification is not easy to earn. The process can last up to five years. Candidates must pass a comprehensive discipline-specific assessment while also submitting portfolios of student work, video of their teaching practices, and extensive commentary about instructional decisions and impact. Then, if they want to maintain their certification, teachers must demonstrate further growth every five years through additional portfolio submissions and commentary. Now, if I can just brag a little extra on our teachers, I want everyone to know that 18 teachers in the entire state of Tennessee earned national board certification this school year. And eight of those 18 are in one district, which would be this one. <laughs> to call up those eight teachers. Please come up front as I call your names, then we'll take a photo, and then we'll recognize another eight teachers who have maintained their National Board certification. So, um, our new National Board certified teachers are, please give it up for them, Michael Bino from the MPS Office of English Learners. <laughs> Dr. Teresa Bogoma from MPS Virtual School. Christina Butler from John Overton High School. <laughs> Mackenzie Coveney from John Overton High School. <laughs> Zach Fox from Martin Luther King Jr. Academic Magnet High School. <laughs> See that smile, Ebenezer? That's his navigator. <laughs> 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 Lacey Gold, Goldbaith uh, from John Overton High School. <laughs> Tyler Selbraid from Martin Luther King Jr. Academic Magnet High School. <laughs> and Hannah Yonker from Glenview Elementary School. So congratulations, teachers. We're all so proud of you. Um, we're going to take, can we take a quick photo real quick before we move to the next? All right, come on up so we can get a picture together. And board members, if you have a school represented, please join us. <laughs> I'm trying. 
trying to get some bites in. I know, right? Without being rude. Mm -hmm. Mr. Fox, good to see you. And how are you? Mr. Silver, Ebenezer should get up there. Yeah, Ebenezer, you should be up there with your navigator. Yeah. Sorry. People from your school. Right. One, two, three. On charger. Yes. Okay. I'll get you later. to also recognize eight veteran teachers who have maintained their National Board certification. Again, please come up as I call your names and then we'll also get a photo together. Dr. Tina Atkinson from Percy Priest Elementary School. <laughs> Whit Campbell from Martin Luther King Jr. Academic Magnet High School. Julie Dernberger from Neely's Bend Elementary School. <laughs> Deborah Higdon from Granberry Elementary School. Hey. Amy Leslie, who serves through the MPS Support Hub. <laughs> Lori Likens from Neely's Bend Elementary School. Heather Penrod from East Nashville Magnet High School. And Lauren Stetka from Creve Hall Elementary School. All right, congratulations to each of you as well. Um, we are so proud of our nationally board certified teachers and our team MPS members um, who responded to the covenant call. But can we have this group of leaders please join us up front for a quick photo? Congratulations again. Salad is full of nuts and cranberries. Did you make it? Did you make it? Okay. Thank you. Um, it has been very nice today to be able to say that if Nashville is needing good news, that we have plenty of it at MMPS, and I think the community can pretty much always count on that. So we really appreciate everyone being here so that we can honor them. That is a tremendous amount of work, um, not only for um, the new teachers, but also the renewals of their cert certification for National Board Certified. Um, that brings us to our public participation. We have a list that will be up on the board. There you go. Public participation, as this is the group of people that have signed up to speak, I do need to make sure that if you're here to speak about the certification of dismissal charges, that you are speaking about what's on the agenda for Mr. Waite, um, and it's not for the previous student because that was a closed meeting. So I want to make sure that we have that conversation before anyone potentially comes up here and uses that student's name. Otherwise, everybody has three minutes. Please keep in mind that your names are kind of be in order. We will call them in order, and 
Again, you have three minutes. And at the end of it, do we have the buzzer back? hey we found the buzzer. Because um, it was like a weird noise <laughs> last meeting. But that's not weird. We know that sound. <laughs> All right, so you have three minutes, and we're going to start first with Kelly Gibbs. No. Okay. Then we're going to speak to Risha Brown. Hear from Risha Brown, I should say. Excuse me. Or take my shoes off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, my name is Risa, but I go by Missy you. Brown. Yes. Um, I first want to tell you how much I appreciate being able to address the board today. I've been looking forward to it. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, I have been teaching for 30 years, uh, mainly uh, science, uh, biology, help P. Uh, I've coached uh, for probably 17, uh, mainly basketball, if you can tell the height there, you probably <laughs> guessed that, uh, basketball, but sprinkle in some volleyball and track and cross country, then uh, you've got 17 years there. Um, so 30 years total this year. Um, I started on my master's and my EDS early in my teaching career, but with all that said, I have absolutely loved my journey. I, I am a teacher first, coach second. Um, I just love the classroom. And even though I, I, I went on, I was thinking about administration, I just never did jump through that hoop because I've always enjoyed teaching so much. I would not trade that experience for anything as an educator. Um, I have found that the longer that I teach, the more devoted I have become to help navigate student paths. And uh, recently, I have entertained the idea of, uh, of retiring and pursuing other careers because I have been at the top of my pay scale for the last few years. Uh, so with this being said, I am definitely advocating for teacher longevity pay. I have taught in several school districts across the state of Tennessee, and Metro Nashville is one of the most challenging districts in the state. However, teachers are not monetarily rewarded for their years of service. We have highly skilled teachers that have a wealth of knowledge and expertise that bring a sense of value and stability to the classroom. I personally feel that it is discouraging to our profession when master teachers are not treated worthy of such an accomplishment after so many years of service. And as we all know, experience is priceless. But in our profession, it's very underappreciated. In the end, our students are paying the price when our veteran teachers leave our system to retire early or to work in another district. <laughs> With all the chaos around the educational system, I feel that it is imperative that we refocus our efforts and give credit to those teachers we can count on. Thank you. <laughs> Next is Mary Jo Cram. Hi, uh, my name is Mary Jo Cram. I'm secretary treasurer of MNEA. I teach Spanish and U.S. history at the Academy del Cockerel, and I also have two children at Dan Mills Elementary. I'm here to talk about next year's budget, especially the need to improve salaries for our longest serving teachers. Since I personally do not yet qualify for longevity pay, I asked some of the senior teachers at my school to come speak on this issue. Our school's counselor, T Tammy Nash, was not able to be here tonight, so I came to read her words. Ms. Nash is a 39-year educator, and this is what she has to say, quote, since I began teaching in 1984, I've consistently had at least one part-time job, and many times two part-time jobs to make ends meet. I've watched myself and others struggle to live in the middle class. On one occasion, a local attorney confided to me that most of the individuals he represents in bankruptcy court are educators. He felt comfortable telling me that because his mother was one of them. 
Daily, we are reminded of the challenges and even dangers of teaching. Why do individuals choose to teach? It's not because they cannot pursue other careers. Those who do teach know that it's something we are called to do. The monetary rewards are not the driving force. Changing lives and spending the day where learning comes to life is what keeps us going. Longevity is a goal in any career. If public education is to continue to exist as we know it, realistic and fair compensation is needed to support those who dedicate their lives to education. Longevity pay incentives are what allow educators to meet the demands of extended careers with the necessary focus. I would not change a day of my 39 years, but I think I could have been better at my job without worrying about financial survival. Thank you. That was Ms. Nash from my school. Um, thanks for listening. Thank you. Next we have Angel Sims. We have Lindsay Leak. Thank you. It's like I before E. Okay. <laughs> Except after C. <laughs> All right. Hello. Hi. Almost exactly two years ago, I addressed the board asking for support for our LGBTQ plus students, staff, and families. As you prepare next year's budget, including money for instructional materials and SEL supports, please consider my words today. On March 20th, 2023, the MNEA Representative Assembly passed this resolution, which I will read parts of. MNEA calls on the MNPS Board of Education to once again pass a resolution asserting its support for all MNPS students, staff, and families, regardless of gender identity, gender expression, or sexual orientation. Whereas bills targeting LGBTQ plus Tennesseans violate the human rights of students, teachers, and community members. As educators, it is our job to protect our school communities and stand against these bills as both our moral and professional responsibility. Whereas an inclusive curriculum and access to texts with diverse perspectives is vital to the well-being of all students for creating representation and developing empathy. LGBTQ plus students deserve to see themselves mirrored in the books they can access at school, and all students deserve access to texts with diverse perspectives. Whereas the Age Appropriate Materials Act of 2022 requires schools to catalog all texts in school libraries and enables individual parents to have texts removed for all students. This bill has been used to target and remove materials that address LGBTQ plus identities, racism, and broad acceptance of diversity. Whereas Senate Bill 1117 and House Bill 1411 will require students to obtain parent permission to participate in Gender Sexuality Alliance or GSA clubs in the school. This would put these students without home, safe home environments at risk. Restricting the organization of any student affinity group limits the freedom of expression of students and staff in school as well as violates our district's autonomy to create safe spaces for students. Whereas House Bill 1269 and Senate Bill 466 encourages teachers and staffs to misgender students, directly contradicting MNPS's policy that, quote, shall allow students and staff to use requested names and pronouns without requiring a legal name change or medical diagnosis, end quote. And is contrary to the widely recognized negative mental health impacts of misgendering. Whereas these bills would allow state control over everyday decisions that educators make to support our students and welcome them in our schools and classrooms. We are standing up for our teachers and students' rights to have an honest and inclusive curriculum and learning environments. Allowing the state to banish these materials and conversations or allowing parents to opt out of these conversations will perpetrate homophobia, further alienate LGBTQ plus students, and fail to prepare our students to exist in a multicultural world. Whereas refusing to stand by and watch these bills pass and refusing to follow these homophobic and transphobic guidelines from our state if they come to pass, we will literally save lives. Resolve that MNEA calls on the MNPS Board of Education to update its April 27, 2021 resolution in support of LGBTQ plus students and staff. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Charlene Culberson. Good evening. Uh, my name is Charlene Colbertson. I am an MNPS graduate and currently in my fifth year of teaching at Schwab Elementary, where I've been grade level chair the entire time. I'm here to oppose the proposed plan of having a single permanent substitute at each school site and phasing out day-to-day -day substitutes. At Schwab, we serve pre-K to fifth grade students. We have over 40 positions in the school that on any given day could need a sub. As I stated, I am the grade level chair for pre-K at Schwab. There are eight adults in my grade level alone, three teachers and five EAs. That is one grade level. 
How well do you think student needs will be met with one sub? How will the mental health be for those teachers splitting classes? I guarantee that if you push this through, you'll see you'll need more than just substitutes. You'll need to hire new teachers. That being said, I do have a request. We'd need to see the numbers on what the cost would be to increase sub pay to a competitive rate. If you're not prepared to share this information this evening, I ask that you defer the vote on the budget until it is available. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Diana Flegel. Hi, my name is Diana Flegel, and I am the blended pre-K teacher and team lead at Fall Hamilton Elementary School. I am concerned about the new substitute changes. Teachers have not been consulted about these changes to my knowledge. I try to stay abreast and pay attention, and we've not heard any of this until quite recently. At my school, the subs this year have been very hard to find or get. When this happens, we have to take on extra students in our rooms. This is very stressful and hard to do. We know that students work better at set, small ratios. And when we combine classes, not only are we stressing out our students who cannot then learn, we are stressing out our teachers and adding to their extra workload, which we know is very full. This affects student learning and is also, it is very uncommon to get reimbursed for this extra work that teachers are doing. I am concerned about the idea of building subs. In my experiences, those subs are often pulled into long-term absences like FMLA. When this happens, teachers go back to having to cover other classes and combine. Again, it is not uncommon for more than one teacher to be absent at a time, so one sub will not cut it. Personally, I have been absent this year, and I feel guilty every time I have to take off because I know of the added workload and stress that I am giving to my other teachers at school. I was not physically able to go because I had COVID. Classes are not getting covered by subs. Have we tried increasing our sub pay to see if we get more interest in people coming? Nashville is a gig economy. Let's work the system. In an effort to have transparency and explore all of our solutions for our current sub issues, we would love to see the numbers on what the costs would be to increase sub pay to a competitive rate. If you all do not have these numbers to present tonight at today's budget meeting, I request that you defer this vote until we can see the budget ahead of time. Thank you. Next is Laura Leonard. Hallie Trogger. Okay. Susan Norwood. I'll say. I see her. Got to take off my glasses so I can see. My name is Susan Norwood. I live in District 8 in Davidson County. I have taught in Metro for 15 years, and this is my 12th year as an English teacher at McGavick High School. I recently learned that the district plans to replace day-to-day -day subs with building subs, now called classroom associates. We did this 12 years ago when I started at McGavick. My school had five permanent subs, and what we learned from this is that five was never enough. We all always needed more subs. What do teachers know about this plan? Well, nothing really. We have no specific information, such as how many classroom associates each building would have. We have had days when over 25, even 30 students are out at McGavick, so it would take more than five classroom associates to fill our vacancies. What would the cost be to increase sub pay? If we don't know what it would cost, I ask you to defer the vote on the budget until we get that number. Every day when I go to school, I open up my email to read the pleas from academy principals and secretaries for teachers to cover classes, multiple classes, without a sub. So teachers chip in and go without their planning periods. Over time, this erodes the quality of instruction we are able to deliver. We need time to plan lessons. We have a desperate need for subs because we don't have enough teachers. This year at McGavick, we have been without English, math, history, chemistry, physical science, and Spanish teachers. These classes are taught by subs and teachers who don't necessarily have training in that content area, such as a social studies teacher teaching English or an art teacher teaching Spanish. 
So what is a better solution to this problem of not enough subs? I have three suggestions. One, pay subs better, a lot better. One sub recently told me that after deductions, he only makes about $13 an hour. My students make more money working at fast food restaurants or grocery stores. Two, get to the root of the problem, which is the teacher shortage. We wouldn't need as many subs if we had a decent supply of teachers. We are leaving the profession in droves because our salaries aren't enough to live on. Three, improve discipline. This is the issue that no one wants to talk about. Student behavior is another main reason that subs quit or avoid going to some schools. Hiring building subs in lieu of day-to-day -day subs is not going to solve the problem. It didn't work 12 years ago, and it won't work now. The teacher exodus and need for subs will only get worse. We both need a substantial pay raise in order to attract people to these positions. Thank you. Thank you. Khadija Garba? No. And I've heard that Holly Trogger has entered. about that, I got caught up with my robotics team. Um, good evening. My name is Holly Trogger, and I am a resident of the 6th District and an engineering and bio-STEM teacher at Antioch High School. Um, I'm here to urge you to raise pay for all MNPS substitute teachers, and especially day-to-day -day subs, to a living wage. I ask that you defer voting on the budget until clarity is provided about the dollar amount necessary to achieve this adjustment. Substitute teachers play a critical role in our schools every day. They cover unfortunately vacant classes, they ensure there's adequate supervision to keep schools safe, and they make it possible for teachers to leave the building to accompany students on special opportunities. For example, at this time of year, all of our high school CTSOs are traveling for state conferences. Last week, I was in Chattanooga for the Technology Student Association State Leadership Conference. Um, and as a side note, I'm proud that MNPS students from both Antioch and MLK um, medaled and qualified for the national level. Um, and substitute teachers absolutely make this CTSO travel and all other field trips possible. Without adequate sub coverage, we're left to worry that, that sub, such special opportunities for some students come at the expense of other students' learning. In my own case, my A-Day students were able to continue learning computer-aided design in my classroom on the specialized computers that they need. My B-Day students got split, and so they weren't with the computers. They missed the opportunity to work on CAD that day. And this same scenario plays out on a daily basis whenever students are, whether teachers are out for field trips, for sick days, or for bereavement days. Unfortunately, our substitute teachers are currently not paid at a rate that reflects and re respects the critical role they play in our schools. This is not only deeply unfair to them as education professionals, but also creates day-to-day -day challenges in our schools that ultimately harm students. Teachers, administrators, and support staff are pulled from our posts to cover classes. We need, le lose the time we need to prepare engaging lessons, prep for lab experiments, um, and in some cases, because of the academy model, we have the same prep at the same time. So my academy gets all pulled to, to cover 1A, and that leaves our whole part of the building really under-supervised. Um, constantly covering classes is exhausting and comes at the other expense, the expense of work we need to support students' learning and contributes to teacher burnout that in turn drives greater vacancies and greater need for sub-coverage in, in a vicious cycle. My school benefits from some truly excellent school-based subs who are assigned to our building daily and provide a consistent presence for students. I absolutely would love to have more of this type of sub. However, our coverage needs both vary greatly and ex greatly exceed the coverage these in individuals can provide, um, generally by a factor of five to 10. We routinely have double-digit numbers of uncovered absences, those that teachers need to give up planning time to cover or in which students are split to other classes. We need both building subs and day-to-day -day subs, and we most urgently need to raise day-to-day -day substitute teacher pay to a rate that would support full coverage in our buildings. I urge you to defer voting on the budget until the full cost of raising sub pay to a living wage is clarified, and to ensure that the 2023 to 2024 budget includes all the funds necessary to pay substitute teachers at a rate that respects them as professionals, enables them to live in our city, and ensures that day-to-day -day absences are filled in all schools every day. Thank you so much, and thanks for the accommodation. Thank you. Okay, that ends public participation and brings us to governance issues, which is first our consent agenda. We have adopted the agenda as listed. May I have a motion to approve the agenda? Second. All those in favor? Seeing no objections, the consent agenda has been approved. That brings us to number two, which is a certification of charges conversation. Justin, do you need to have anything to say on that? 
No? Okay. That's fine. Do we have any motion for approving or not approving the certification of charges hearing? So moved. Second. Second. Is it moved to approve? Oh, moved to approve. Um, yeah, certification of charges. Second. To uphold them? Is that the better phrasing? Okay. Motion to motion to uphold the motion to uphold the decision as okay. Motion to approve. Motion to uphold the decision as drafted. Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. No objections. Next, that brings us to number three, which is a level three student discipline appeal. Of course, that is different from this afternoon's. Do I have a motion to approve for it to come in front of us? I move to, I move to approve uh, the appeal process. I to bring the motion. To so hear the whole hearing. Okay. Second. All right, so we have a motion to have the hearing. All those in favor, please raise your hand. It's unanimous as well. That brings us lastly to the fiscal year. Do I have... I have a motion for the budget. A uh, motion to approve the 23-24 aspirational budget and the federal funding budget and the federal nutrition and the nutrition budget. Do we have a second? Will you please repeat your motion? Okay. Do you want to take them one at a time or do you want to take them all together? We can take them all together. Okay. Motion to approve the, 20, the fiscal year 23-24 aspirational budget. Also, motion to uh, also to include the federal grants budget and the fiscal the nutritional service budget. Second it. Do we have any discussion? Abigail. Yes. Thank you. Um, one thing that's kind of been something around in my head about this that, that I just wanted to, to make a comment on um, is I, I, I like the kind of aspirational budget the way that we're doing it. I think that's a good thing to do and I appreciate that Dr. Battle has moved in that direction. Um, my only hesitation is sometimes I hear from council members who um, treat it as if that means that they get to pick everything that MMPS will do and, um, and I want to make sure that we understand that at the end of the day, the decision-making process for how money gets spent in MMPS ends up on our shoulders. And we're the ones who have that fiduciary responsibility for that. And I want to make sure that as we are looking at it and we're um, looking at what the choices are, that we're making sure that, that we maybe choose something specific to advocate for so that as individual members, if we are choosing to advocate for something in that aspirational budget, that we're giving direction to our council members instead of just laying it in front of them and, and letting them dictate what happens, but that we kind of help drive that by um, doing direct appeals for things that we think are, are you know, top priority aspirational budget. Um, and I think that that's something we have done in the past. It's something I would like to see us continue to do. It's something that I would like to continue to engage the public to do as well, that if there is a specific item on the aspirational budget that um, you have very strong beliefs about that we need to focus on, that that is something that you advocate for specifically um, instead of just kind of sitting back and, and letting somebody else make the choice for you. Uh, I think it's really important that, that we see it more as a less of a... Um, somebody's telling you how to spend the money and more of a um, discussion between the two groups to say, you know, for them to ask, you've given us a lot of choices. We're not going to be able to fund them all. So what's your priorities? That way we can respond and it can be a partnership between us and the city council as opposed to somebody being feeling dictated towards um, and I, uh, so yeah, so that's just, that's kind of just a general statement about, I would love to see the board members specifically pick a few things to really advocate for on our own with the aspirational budget, as opposed to just hoping that what we want to get funded will get funded, but that we actually have a voice in that and we move it forward and, and we advocate for that loudly. So yeah, that's. 
birthday. I talk. I've Go talked ahead. a lot. Today. You, Go ahead. You, okay. Pastor. All right. Um, I just would, you know, in light of the um, some of the speakers tonight, I'd like. Um, an explanation of how how the single permanent sub thing will work. How we'll determine how many permanent subs per school, um, or is it really just one per school? And then sort of the process for phasing out daily subs, as it's my understanding that that's not something that's just going to go away immediately. So, um, yeah, I just would love a deeper explanation of all that. Um, so this is um, actually a presentation that we've gone over um, with m and &E um, through our community budget meeting and all four of our community and budget meetings. I apologize. I was doing a panel the night of my community budget meeting, and I'm fully aware I missed the budget committee meeting because of a work commitment, <laughs> and so I'm playing catch-up right now on everyone else's just, time. Just for, just for clarity. So this is, <laughs> just, just for clarity, we, we have talked uh, pretty loudly and frequently about yeah. um, our classroom associates, um, approach, including with um, our principal leaders as well. Um, so lots of engagement um, that has taken place. I'm going to ask um, Lisa, um, do you mind coming up and um, again talking through what our classroom associates uh, model looks like, um, including the fact that there is not a current plan to plan to completely phase out the traditional model that has not um, yet reaped it, the benefits that we once intended um, in that model. Thank you. So we piloted the general school assistant two years ago with um, a, a few. <laughs> we let people, we let principals um, have a general school assistant that they could use for whatever they needed to in their building as a floater. That pilot went well the first year. We added a few more positions this last year. We currently have close to 200 in the, in the district. And principals have been using those positions to work in, in classrooms, work in the office, work in the cafeteria, wherever they needed them. So we started listening to principals and hearing the feedback about how valuable it was to have extra people in the building. We started also looking at the research. Um, there's a lot of research from 2018 forward about the what we call the permanent sub model really being a best practice. And we want to be out in front of that. And so we, we talked to some principals. We revised the job description. We increased the pay grade from a pay grade three to a pay grade five. What, we, what we're looking for is now people who are going to be in the schools to really be a part of the school community, to participate in collaborative planning with teachers, to work with, to go to PD to work with you know, teachers in their classrooms to push in if there's not a need for a substitute that day, to, to be in classrooms as those extra helpers. We're also, you know, this is a full-time job, benefits job, everything that a, a regular employee gets. But what we're also looking for is sort of that pipeline because a lot of our general school assistants have said, I really like this. Can I become a teacher? Is there a way for me to do that? And so helping fill a pipeline for people who want to get into um, an ed prep program or a grow your own program or an apprenticeship program of some kind to add to the teaching ranks um, is also a really a big part of this. It's a big piece of this. Our day-to-day -day subs don't necessarily want to do that. That's they choose the day-to-day -day sub route because they don't necessarily want to become the full-time <laughs> teachers. We can't, we can't do away with the day-to-day -day sub model at the same time, right? We, that's a phase-out kind of thing. And I don't, know, I don't know how long we would need necessarily to keep or not keep that day-to-day -day sub model. But what we're really looking for is that cohort of people in our schools that is a part of the school community. Because if that person is in the school and the, they know the teachers and the teachers know them, they know the resources in the school. If there's a problem while they're substituting in a classroom, they know who to call. It's not just an office referral. They might call the advocacy center coach or they might call the counselor or they might call you know somebody that they know can help. They're also going to be there when that teacher comes back the next day to be able to say, this is what went well, this is where we struggled, 
you know, this is what I got to, all the, all the things that a teacher might not get from that day-to-day -day sub who isn't there the next day. Appreciate all that, um, but that, that isn't actually, I understand why it's a good idea to have G, GSAs. I just, what I really wanted to know um, is the questions I asked about, um, about how we determine how many per building and what is the exact process for phasing out the daily subs. So the determination of the number per building, I think we're still, we're still working with. We've, we've got some principles that have been helping us kind of think this through in terms of the ratios. We're still working on that. Um, definitely more. How did we know now. how much to put in the budget if we're still working on the ratios? I think we estimated a number. What number did we estimate? It's about two and a half times. It's about two and a half times the more number that we have the number now. that we have now. So it's based upon the enrollment um, of the school, um, which would um, uh, almost triple the number of current general school assistants that are serving in schools right now. So a school who currently has three would have eight, um, as an example. Okay. And then are we planning to completely phase out day-to-day -day subs or will we hang on to we're, that? We're currently a in a pilot right now. We started piloting this about two years ago um, and each year we've kind of increased the number, the ratio um, of leaders in the role. We've also increased the pay and tried to look at the job description to make sure that um, the job description meets the needs um, of the schools. And so um, as we're looking at a national best practice now uh, with regards to moving um, to this model, we'll continue to look at our own local um, um, data will continue to follow the research to make the determination as to when it's most appropriate. But this is a pretty new innovative way um, of how we're transitioning um, substitute um, the substitute model into the classroom associate. So a final determination has not been made on exactly when um, that phase out will occur, um, but we are currently in year two of our pilot as we look to um, fully make the transition and maintain in a portion of the traditional substitute model. Yeah. Okay. So we are looking to phase out single or next stuff. year. But I mean, not next year, but I mean, like eventually. It, it, eventually, that is part if of the, the model term. works, if the model works, eventually okay. we will be looking at a phase out. But we're not looking at a phase out for this current um, year of transition into the classroom associates. Okay. However, the bottom line is that classroom associates provide more stability, more continuity mm -hmm. um, of instructional practices and supports um, for students, and so it's about us leveling up the amount of support, um, both in the SEL and the academic space, um, that needs to be true not only for our students, but also for our teachers. Okay. So, so as we're doing this hiring process, say you have three permanent subs in your building, but you need eight subs that day, there will still be the ability to call for daily subs? Absolutely. Have we considered raising the pay for those daily subs along the way? I mean, I know we haven't done that in our aspirational budget. Our process, our process has been to find a more efficient and effective way to provide the coverage we need um, in our buildings. And at some point, we've got to stop um, in investing in the things that are not working and find out, figure out new ways to make sure that we're closing the loop and getting better outcomes for what we're trying to make sure is true for every student in every building. Okay. I have another question, but I'm happy to like do it on a second round if other people have, because it, it veers to a different area. Okay. I have a quick follow-up question to the pay grades. May I ask it directly to you, or Lisa? Uh, the question would be, what does pay grade, what do those pay grade numbers mean? I know we've heard it in the community meetings, but will you please provide that? Can you start with the first iteration and what we're proposing for next school year, Lisa? So in the, the current iteration, the beginning wage for somebody who doesn't have a bachelor's degree would be $18.36 an hour. In the new iteration, it would be $18.80 an hour on today's pay scale that would not include any COLA that might be attached to next year's pay scale. And where did their rate start in the initial pilot phase? In the initial pilot phase, it was roughly the same daily rate as the $13 per hour for the sub. So when the, the support pay scale moved to the $18 minimum, this grade went with it. 
And so my point of get, um, asking for that um, clarity is that over time, we've continued to um, invest in our substitute model pay, um, which uh, in a way that best serves our students um, and our schools. So that grade has moved from um, $13 an hour up to what we're proposing and uh, nearly $19 an hour um, next school year, and that's before any um, adjustments to our pay scale moving to the next budget cycle. Thank you. Any additional questions? Frida. Uh, this is more of a comment more than more than a question um, and to respond to budget vice chairs Tyler's point um, this budget process has is um, has been interesting one that has developed over the years. And the tough part has been how do you strike that balance of advocating and also having um, accurate numbers to work with. And so we, that's how we always try to transform this budget process. Uh, first, by setting our budget priorities, saying these are the top three, four things that we will truly want to focus on directing our financial resources. Um, part of it, this is just the aspirational budget. Um, and that the, co the conversation between us and the board, the council and the community will develop between now and when we pass the real budget in June. Um, part of it is we are bound, unfortunately we're bound by the charter. We have, the, the mayor has to submit a budget by April 30th to file by May, April 1st. We are considered under that budget, so we have to present something to him with that. And so um, we have done in the past, and it's caused a lot of contention, a lot of frustration about what is needed, what are the priorities. Um, with with that, and so as we as this process develops, my goal is to hope as we move on through the process, we as a board be able to refine that discussion and those priorities as we did. Remember last year, when we after we passed our budget and made our file, we had a twenty million dollar deficit that we did not foresee, and so. I want us to be cautious to saying we are going to present and advocate for this and then have to renege on it because by circumstances that are beyond our control, we have to fill a deficit in ways and work with the mayor's office or the council office to fulfill that. I think we can articulate what we want, how we want it, and how to want to do that. I think we have done a great job in the past of talking to our own council members, especially within our districts, to try to articulate what our individual goals, what our goals as a board, how we speak, um, and I know um, as employees, as community leaders, um, we all have our own priorities, our own desires to improve it, but we have a finite amount of funds, and as we're going through this transformation, particularly from BEP to TISA, we're trying to really figure out what is that process going to do. Unfortunately, we're in a transition time, and that, and to be so explicit, it's difficult. I think it's an ongoing conversation. We hope it's an ongoing conversation. We hope to have a retreat later on, and we were talking about that, to really kind of get into the meat of this after the um, after the May 1st. So um, I agree with you, Vice Chair Tyler, um, but also understanding to the community, um, it's a difficult process that we're going through because our timing, the state's timing, do not align. And if they did, it would be a different conversation and a much easier and smoother process. But there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of moving parts that's consistent between now and June 30th. Um, I hope, and the state's listening, that they will speed up their timeline and their processes um, in a more efficient way. I think myself and the other, was it 114 school districts? <laughs> Wishful <laughs> thinking. <clears throat> Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. We would actually would actually appreciate that too. It's not just us, but every school district in the state would actually do this. But it's one of the things we really want people to communicate that with us and the council, and because they're gonna have a collective communication, a collective a collective conversation um, with that. Because it's one of the things we heard um, before Dr. Battle's tenure is this tension between fully funding schools and not funding and what we really need and what. And that's where it's like we're just gonna be transparent and lay everything on table at the true 
the cost, as it's a continual conversation year after year, and as we refine that time within Pacific budget years, but have a longer goal. So this is a conversation not for us, but also for the mayor's office, the mayoral candidates, the new council that are coming in. If we as a city are, are committed to do this, we need more resources, not just for Pacific one-off items in the aspirational budget as individual, but as a collective allocation to the metro schools, particularly what we are required to do by the state. Um, and so I hope as we have these conversations, particularly during this political season, that we really f double down on saying these costs, these have real costs and we need real substantial investment. With the investment that um, Mayor Cooper has done over the past uh, four, three and a half years, four years of his tenure, we have seen the growth of being a level five school, having the record number of reward schools, having the least amount of property schools. The investments work, but it has to be a collective conversation so we can have the detailed conversation of advocating for what you want specifically, or us as a board, not you particularly, but you individually, collectively. <laughs> Guess what you want, Miss Masters? <laughs> what you specifically want, um, also too. So um, I just really want to kind of just um, have a full, just a full sort of discussion with that for the community to understand why we evolved into this process and really try to have a more collaborative conversation um, with us and with council and understanding that um, our process is different and is not as succinct and clean as it is on the metro government side because they are much more streamlined and they have their own specific revenue sources and they're not as dealing with the state as much as we do. We wish we could, but that's a whole different conversation, a whole different political, <laughs> financial, and budget revenue process. I would like to add that we also had our community meetings in each quadrant. During those, we had lots of discussion with individual staff, groups of staff, and of course, different stakeholders and parents. Some of those conversations will help inform what those priorities are that we will discuss as a board and work with council and the mayor to prioritize. Because again, it is a large menu of options because we are trying to be transparent of what all the different costs are and the ongoing costs that, it, that are a part of education um, and how it is important and how each one of those dollars directly impacts whatever the action is or the work that we need to do. So we want to be transparent with that information, but we can't understand that the menu of options can appear overwhelming. That's because there's a lot of work that's done inside of our schools and that work is extremely important and valuable and it's a huge menu of options. So we've had a lot of input. We will continue to receive that input and we'll work on refining it um, as we go along and have better discussions with council. All right, we'll do our second round of questions. So, Dr. Berthina? I don't have a question. I do have a comment. Um, I just want to uplift um, Ms. Frida Player and, and Ms. Elrod um, on what they said. Right now, we are in so much unknown with this transition from BEP to TISA around funding and what we're expected. Currently, the where, where we stand, um, being the second largest school district in our state, um, right now, we are expected to receive the lowest, if not one of the lowest, allocations of the 147 districts across our state. Um, and, and so we're looking at how that's going to impact us, and we have to be very conservative in how we budget and what we budget, because we just haven't gotten the answers that we need currently. And so please excuse us for our conservatism when it comes to our budget, really having those robust, intense conversations about what we're going to prioritize and how we're going to prioritize things. We are dealing with a finite amount amount of funding, um, and some of that funding we have to give away to. And so we have to look at all the, the all of the areas that we're looking at related to that, that funding mechanism and making sure that, one, we can sustain the operations that we have going on now, and we can continue to build on top of some of those aspirational things that we want to um, be able to bring into our district and build on top of what we're currently doing. And so those are some of those discussions that that we really, really, really have to have. There are going to be some difficult discussions. May not make everyone happy, um, but we have our eye on the prize and continuing to make MNPS the best district um, across our state. Um, thank you. Erin. Um, I just, I, I wanted to follow up a little bit, um, Ms. Player, on what you were saying. It, 
I know coming out of uh, last night's session at Hillsborough High School, there are parents and community members, et cetera, who are eager to help us advocate with the um, council in particular. Um, do we have anything yet that we are sort of the ask that we might have of folks? And can we, um, can, wh what would you recommend at this point Everybody sharing with folks it. about what we want to do in terms of an ask for the budget? I mean, I think at RIPE, we don't have anything specific at the moment because we're still in processes of talking what, when we were, what we were presenting at the continuity of budget and also discussing with the mayor's office with that. I think after that discussion, we can come up with some very detailed talking points. But I think the main thing is like we need more additional funding. I think we start there and then we'll refine it to something very specific to advocate and have parents help advocate for that. But as we continue to do that, as because right now the mayor's office, they're in the middle of finalizing their budget. They're trying to figure their, their revenue projections, the current revenue projections shoring up. So they're still in the last couple weeks are really trying to figure out what they can provide. Um, and as they work with the <laughs> director of finance to determine that. Once they have a good sense of that, then they'll start actually finalizing their budget and then we will have a better idea. So I know people want something right now and right away to do it. You're sort of saying wait like two weeks and we'll have a specific ask for you to yes. make those people. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. Well, I, well, I also, yes. um, one thing is, so we kind of had a three-year plan on pay raises, and we did our teachers, and, and then we looked at our support staff last year, and then so this year is the year that we're supposed to be looking at our administrative pay plan, and um, just like we fought for each other group, I do want to say that um, if we are going to complete our promises, I would think that that would be something that would be at the top of our list to request Agreed. to ensure that we can make sure that we're meeting the promises we've made to our administrators like we did for our teachers and like we did for our support staff. Absolutely. That has absolutely been part of conversations not only this year but last year of this yes. is not just a now ask but a future ask as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Ms. Masters, you had a question. Do you still have I it? do. I got, I got some stuff here. Um, first of all, yes. I've been asking about these principal raises for a while. Glad that's made it to the top of the list. Happy about that. Um, I also want to just clarify that one million five fifty for longevity pay, that in the aspirational budget, that is for teachers. Correct? The one million five hundred and fifty slide sixteen on our in the in the aspirational budget for longevity pay is that for teachers. It is for certificated employees, which okay. are teachers, psychologists, you know, all of our certificated staff who have 25 years or more, okay. and support staff who are at step 25 or higher. Right. I just want to make sure that wasn't, you know, lumped in with the admin pay raise. Um, do we have currently a signed MOU with MNEA, and have we given them the opportunity to fully weigh in on this process? We do have a signed MOU with the MNEA. We have an amendment to that MOU that is going through the review process, and they are a part of, we have a compensation committee with them. Okay. Yes. Okay. I want to reiterate the, the request I've made in the past couple years for a board member um, to sit in on the MOU process in the future. I think that would be um, really helpful to have an advocate from the board. Just a thought. Um, also want to just say as a professional fundraiser, which is what I am, it is a lot more effective to fundraise around something specific. Just saying, we need more money, we need more money, is not an effective strategy. So we've got to hone in on a, a collective ask for, of council. What do we want? What is the top thing that we want? And one short little story, two teachers I know, both with master's degrees, one has been um, in school for 21 years, the other for 31 years. Any guesses as to what the difference is between their two paychecks? 21 year teacher versus 31 year teacher, same level of education, $700. I don't mean per paycheck, I mean per year. So I do think, while I'm very, so there's one of my talking points, talking to council. That's true. I have seen the pay stubs. It's two very specific teachers that have shared this information with me. So I think that's a good talking point for council, for anyone who needs something immediately to start talking about. That's, that's it, that's all I got. 
We have them. Uh, Abenezer, do you have yes. a statement? Thank you. <laughs> I was you just making sure that this? you had been recognized if you needed to be or wanted to be. <laughs> we have a motion to approve. Excuse me? Never mind. Oh, do you have I want to do I know, do you have Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, we have a motion on the floor that's been first and seconded to approve the 23-24 uh, fiscal year budget, which includes, of course, our operational budget, our grants budget, federal budget, and our nutritional budget. It's been first and seconded. All those in favor of approving these budgets, please raise your hand. It is unanimous. Thank you. That brings us to board committee reports. We had a number of meetings today, but they did not have uh, committees. However, we did have uh, Berthina Dava, Dr. Berthina Nava McKinney, who uh, recently attended a conference, and so will you please provide your report on that? Yes. Um, so I attended the Council of Greater City Schools, which is the Council of Large Urban School Districts across the nation, um, their legislative and policy conference in Washington, D.C. Um, it was a, a, a really great conference, learned a lot of information. Moreover, what I learned um, as a new board member coming in is kind of where we sit and where we lead in the nation in a lot of the innovative things that we are doing within our district. Um, so it was it was refreshing and it was also a confirmation that we are kind of leading the way. Um, when I say leading the way, um, our college and career readiness programs through the academies of Nashville um, really is a national motto. We have urban school districts who have not implemented anything similar um, or anything like that within their school districts and are coming to MNP to learn more about the academies of Nashville um, and how to implement those types of programs um, to increase graduation rates and to, uh, to provide programming for students post-graduation. Um, so it is a great partnership um, that we are doing here and we are leading the effort. Um, we had a lot of recognition around our SEL programming um, and the peace centers and advocacy centers that we have implemented within MNP um, that a lot of school districts, and, I'm, and when I say urban school districts, that is your largest school districts across the nation, have are still trying to figure out how to support students around social emotional learning and mental health. And so we are leading the way in doing some of that work, and they are looking at MNPS as a model um, to, to implement that. Um, and also the work that we are doing um, uh, around ELL support. Um, and how we are uh, supporting students in that ELL space. Um, and so I would say while we we as a district um, have areas that we need to grow and continue to develop and continue to improve on, it's reassuring that we are moving in the right direction um, and we are doing some amazing things within MNPS um, that others are looking at us to be able to implement within their own districts. Um, and so I think that that is great things and, there, and, and I think this is an opportunity for us to continue to build upon and improve the practices that we are doing here um, to continue to excel and grow our students and support our students um, and our staff in multiple ways. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to our announcements. Um, sure. What, how, what is this report about? It's what I emailed you about. I don't have that email. No, I don't have I any. Okay. Um, yes, give, go ahead and give your advocacy. Well, I'll just, I'll ask, I mean, are y'all, I consider advocacy even when we don't actually have a meeting. It is ongoing work. Is, is the board interested in hearing a legislative update? Go ahead and go. Okay. Yeah. All right. We need to figure out that email thing. That's not good. Okay. Um, third grade retention. Um, the amendment to delay it one year did not pass. Um, so that's still happening, and Senate Finance approved it. So that's moving on. Um, 
Um, I, I sent everyone a calendar invite for May 19th. That is when TCAT raw scores and cut scores are due to LEAs based on the timeline that was used to pass the bill. So let's all keep an eye out for that date. Um, in, let's see, ESAs now also include Hamilton County. Um, there's an amendment to add Knox to that, so the um, school voucher program can, forges on. Um, the bill to allow teachers to go armed in some situations has been approved by House but is off notice in the Senate. Um, the bill to eliminate maximum class sizes past Senate died in K-12 Education Subcommittee. Um, bill to make us offer more property to charter schools taken off notice. Open enrollment bills, remember we talked about that, like getting go to different districts, all taken off notice. Um, parental consent bills filed. Um, there are different amendments around that. That also relates to the one, the, remember in Senate, there was the exemption for classroom libraries from the age appropriate bill passed in Senate. Um, our wonderful Representative Jernigan championed it in the House. It did not pass in the House. So volunteer opportunity for parents there start cataloging every single book in the school. Um, Raising the minimum teacher salary to 50K has been approved by Senate. With a caveat. But with a provision to prohibit LEAs from withholding dues for professional associations, that has been taken out by House Finance Committee. So there's that. Did you have another caveat to add? Is that the one you were talking about? Okay. Um, and then the bill that would have expanded critical race theory law, AKA prohibit, made it more prohibitive, failed in Senate Education Committee. Um, the bills that have been taken off notice around charter school, homeschool, boarding school bill, um, re rejection of federal money, that, that has been taken off notice. So that's the update, yeah. Can you just say for everyone what off notice means? It's not gonna happen, like right now. <laughs> From a parliamentary standpoint, it's taking it off the agenda. Yeah. 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 So it would be put back on right. the agenda. It didn't fail. Session, but it is not going to pass this session. It cannot pass. Right. Didn't, didn't fail, but very like, I mean, you know, they've been busy doing other things. <laughs> that gets us to announcements. Um, in honor of how we did announcements the last time, I was going to ask our student board members to start us off instead of ending. So can we start with our senior board member? to kick off announcements. Um, thank you. I first want to congratulate all the teachers that were recognized for their certification. Um, it was really cool to see three people from MLK and, I, and seeing that, um, like my A push and my calculus and, and all those teachers up there, I felt like I was going through like my exams again. I was kind of nervous, but it was very cool to see them. And then um, outside of that, I also want to bring up the fact that um, over the last week, there have been several positions that were assigned by MNPS students. Um, this position was basically pleading to the state to, to look more onto the safety of students. And um, I had the opportunity to go down to the Capitol Hill on Thursday when they were doing their protests, and I got to meet with Representative Hemmer and a couple other representatives from the city and also from Memphis, and I met with the, um, a lot of the members of the Democratic Caucus in the, in the bill, I mean, in the, in the Senate, and um, yeah, I just wanted to say that it was kind of, it made me re feel really proud of our district, seeing that we got over 5,000 kids to participate and to sign that petition, and it made it seem like, you know, we are a serious voice that we have to be, that, that has to be considered. Um, outside of that, I also want to bring up that um, the college application season is technically over now, and I do recognize that there is a bit of disappointment that might be lingering with some seniors, but I just want to reiterate that a rejection letter does not define you as a student. It just it defines the school that you apply to, and it tells you that that school just wasn't the right fit, but at the end of the day, you're defined by your merit, and your merit is not something that derives from a letter. Thank you. Amen. Amen. All right, junior board member. 
Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so last month, I had a really fun opportunity to go to travel to Chattanooga for the Tennessee State DECA competition, and I got to see a lot of our MMPS schools. So Hillsboro, me and Hillsboro, we were down there, and so was Antioch, Glencliff, Hillwood, and John Overton. So they all did very well, and it was very fun seeing everybody. And for those who don't know, DECA is basically a business club, business skills organization. Um, uh, goes in hand with a lot of our business academies and CTE, so it's a really great opportunity. I want to shout out a few students. Um, these students advance to ICDC, which is basically the International DECA competition, which will be held in Orlando, Florida this April. So from Antioch High Schools, High School, <coughs> Annalette Gomez Montelier, Carla Castillo Bonilla, both of those two, they participated in hospitality and tourism business operations. And then at Glencliff High School, Bao Lee, Amaya Houston, and Candelaria Mendoza participated in an entrep entrepreneurship uh, event. And then from John Overton High School, Shelby Dykus participated in principles of business administration. So those three all advanced to the international competition. So congrats to them. And then lastly, I just want to say it is prom season. So that is super duper exciting. I want to remind everyone to make smart and responsible decisions <laughs> on prom night. Say that again, um, girl. <laughs> Responsible decisions that you would do in front of your parents. <laughs> and have fun. So yeah. Depends on your parents. <laughs> Thank you both. We really appreciate it. All right. District three. Oh, I always forget that I'm going next. Okay. Um, I just want to remind everyone, pack meeting, district wide pack meeting. This Thursday, 6 to 7.30 p.m. in the Wellness Center. Everyone should come. There's going to be a wonderful presentation on safety. It's going to answer a whole bunch of the questions that have been hit in our inboxes. So many questions. Um, also just want to echo the pride that Ab Ebenezer spoke of um, with how our students have advocated. Um, was pr very proud in particular to see my friend Wyatt, whom I've known since he was about six, um, who is now a senior at Hume Fogg High School, um, on CNN. <laughs> so that was exciting. Um, Given a speech, like a big boy. It was, it was good stuff. Um, also, I have one more thing I have to find. Wait, wait. I have to find my Sue Kessler email, so I'll say the name right. I want to say... This is exciting. Do y'all know how many WNBA coaches are men? It's kind of a lot. It's 38%. That's like a lot, right? So how many NBA coaches do you think are women? 13%. Maybe 1%. Okay. 0%. There's one. There's one. one. There's one. Yeah. There's one. So, like, I don't know. I don't know what that percentage works out to. But... <laughs> This kind of really, I don't know. I'm trying to be fun with this. The new um, head coach for boys basketball at Hunters Lane High School in District 3 is a fantastic woman named Katrina Carter. And I just think that's exciting and cool. And I think we should give her a hand. All right, that's all I got. District 4. So first of all, um, whew, yeah, this is tough. I have a daughter whose birthday is today. She turned 30 years old, but I'm only 25, so I can't do the math. <laughs> but um, happy birthday to my daughter, Layla. Um, she's 30 years old today. Um, and she is a 2010 graduate of Antioch High School. So um, a proud MNPS student. Um, next, I want to re, uh, reiterate what Emily said. We have our PAC meeting that's coming up um, this Thursday, April 13th, from 6 to 7.30 at the MNPS Wellness Center, it, which is right across from the boardroom um, in the same parking lot. Um, so hope to see you all out. Our discussion is on safety and security. Um, so please spread the word and communicate with everyone that you know um, who has questions about that so that they can attend. Um, hope to see you there. Um, next, I want to um, congratulate, we were able to attend the teacher and principal um, 
um, uh, Principals of the Year award ceremony uh, last week. Last week? Yes. Support and principals. Support and principals, yes. Um, and so want to reiterate and congratulate all of those who were awarded um, uh, with those recognitions and to, to, to thank all of our teachers and support staff and principals and everyone who makes MNPS um, be the best place that it can be. So really thank you. Thank, thanks to all of you um, and especially to those who have been recognized. Um, also was able to attend a partnership today. Um, uh, an, an, uh, uh, You're going to talk about my school. No. Um, so was able to attend a partnership today. Um, we're really excited about the partnership between Fisk University. Oh, that is your school. Dang. <laughs> announce it. Nope, 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 nope. I won't step on her two schools um, that had some amazing recognitions today, so we're really excited about that, and congratulations to them. Um, and I wouldn't be remiss if I didn't acknowledge what we have experienced over the last couple of weeks um, with the power of our students and the voices of our students and families leading the discussion around gun violence um, and how we have to have safer laws in place to protect children in schools, in uh, places of worship, and everywhere. We just have to do better as a community, as a society, as a state. Um, so I am really proud of all of the students who really work to lead this discussion and lead the impact. We have seen the negative rollout of what has happened, um, and then the powerful movement that has created to uh, restore um, some of this justice. And so um, I I am excited that as a result um, of just Representative Justin Jones getting expelled from the Tennessee legislature, he was reappointed by a unanimous vote from our Metro Council to reinstate him back to the Tennessee legislature. So thank you for all of your all of the students who have participated, who helped organize and galvanize peaceful discussion and protest and really hold um, our leaders accountable. Thank you, thank you, um, thank you for this work. Um, and without further ado, you guys have a great night. District 6. All righty. So I just have two things. First, I want to uh, put out a reminder. Our monthly District 6 community meeting will be next Tuesday, April 18th at 6.30 p.m. at the Southeast Branch Library. Uh, we will be in the children's story room at 6.30 p.m. next Tuesday. And also, I wanted to give a big shout out to our 2022-23 Teacher of the Year, Ms. Taylor Brown from the Cambridge Early Learning Center. Go Pandas! <laughs> <laughs> On brand. <laughs> Love it. District 7. Um, thank, thank you, Miss Nabon Kinney kind of stole part of my thunder, <laughs> but my great alma mater, Fisk University, is providing 40 scholarships to MMPS students to attend Fisk University, which I'm very proud. I have been bugging Dr. Battle about this <laughs> ever since I've been on the board because Fisk is an awesome university, and the only reason I'm the great leader as I am is because of my leadership skills and my academic skills that I develop at Fisk. So I am glad that the MMPS students will have that great experience of being as a liberal arts college with small classes and professors that really invest in honing you and harass you in a good way <laughs> to become a great and awesome student and for us to provide that um, for free because um, it's not as cheap when I was there <laughs> is a great thing so to be able to have students come out of debt with an awesome education with a historic college I am very proud and very excited not only for my alma mater but more proud of MMPS to be able to share in that and then also um, Glencliff High School will also um, have a dual role employment with Nashville State which I'm very proud because of the students at Glencliff have very unique circumstances and this is a great path that will change generations and change their livelihood for their families. So thank you to Dr. Battle and more importantly to Dr. Jackson for continuing to invest them in PIS schools for those great efforts. So it's a good day in my district. District 8. 
Um, I also just want to I want to echo the sentiments that um, several folks have um, have said around being how proud they were um, and are of our students and um, I uh, Representative Hemmer texted me the picture of you all and he was just as excited to have you all there um, and have you there delivering that um, I think as you were so thank you for doing that and I had the pleasure of being able to see Elena speak um, at the Hillsborough event walk-in memorial. Um, first, just want to say thanks to Dr. Battle and her team for providing opportunities for students all over the district to be able to participate in their schools in a, in a safe memorial and, uh, and thinking about what sort of action students could take. Um, it was uh, a moving experience and also, I think, really empowering for the students um, who were who were there and who participated? Um, also, youth, uh, Hillsborough Youth and Government participated in Youth and Government Day, I think, or something like that on the Hill. Um, and there were uh, maybe twenty some students who were there um, had an amazing experience. So um, excited for them to be able to do that. Um, Last night at Hillsborough, we had the fourth um, of the budget meetings, and earlier in the budget conversation, I didn't. I don't think I actually just said thanks to um, Dr. Battle and team and staff for doing those meetings. I've been getting lots of questions from parents and community members, and it was a good opportunity for them to be able to ask those questions in per in person, um, receive specific answers, um, and then believe me a little more when I say the same thing. Um, so thank you uh, <laughs> for doing that, and then. Um, my last thank you is to all of the school support organizations in the Hillsborough cluster who did a really fantastic job over the last two weeks of reaching out to their own communities to give information about how to support Covenant School, how to support their communities, um, and who uh, were involved in giving money, giving time, giving resources, and just holding up that community, which is really, really in, uh, intertwined with a lot of the schools in the Hillsborough cluster, um, and so grateful to them for their leadership and lastly good luck to students in the next two three weeks three weeks on 10 ready uh, the time is here everybody focus and do a great job we know you can do it thanks district nine Yes. First, I want to do a huge shout out, um, first of all, for all of our teachers who were at the Teacher of the Year um, program, but especially to Dr. Brenda Diaz, who um, was honored to earn the designation of the Metro High School Principal of the Year, and it is so well deserved, and we are so lucky and blessed to have Dr. B at um, Big Picture High School in District 9. So um, we love you, and I'm very, very, very proud of you. Um, also want to uh, take a minute to thank our student leaders who took the time um, not just to think deeply about what has ha been happening and um, how they responded to the Covenant shooting, but also took that emotion and was able, were able to channel it in a way that was meaningful for their unique um, communities at their schools and um, finding a way to take some action within there with the petitions and, and making sure that your voices are still being heard. So I've, I've been really, really proud of our students, and I've heard nothing but good things about how the walk-ins went, and I'm just so appreciative of the work and the effort and the emotion that all of you have put into it. So thank you guys for that and all of our other student leaders. And I want to encourage you not to end there. Continue to lead. Continue to step up. Um, you've seen that it can be really... Um, it can be really helpful and bolstering to feel like you can do something. So we want to continue to encourage you to move forward with that. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Battle for giving our students the time and space to have that and also want to thank her for being supportive of students who um, thought that physically going somewhere else was going to better suit what they wanted to do. So I just I really appreciate your willingness to work within the policies and procedures that MMP, MMPS has in place to make sure that every student was known to do what they needed to do best for them, their selves and their mental and emotional health in responding to this. So we are extremely appreciative of that and thank you for that. Um, and then finally, I want to thank all of our students and our teachers and our staff who have been coming out to support making common sense gun reforms and for increasing mental health supports in Tennessee. We have seen just now that um, our governor has finally decided to um, 
call for um, order of protection laws, which is more colloquially known as red flag laws. And that is something that I think could be very helpful. And I would encourage you, if you've been involved in this, if you've been advocating for anything, to reach out to your council members, reach out to your state legislators, reach out to the people who make the laws to encourage them to move forward with this. Now that we have some momentum going, we don't want to let it slide. So thank you guys very much. And um, just I think it's really important the kind of leadership that we're seeing from our youth. And I want to continue to encourage that and let them know how proud of every all of them we are and, and how much I appreciate what they're doing. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I have the great honor today at being at the fit. I'm not going to take you your momentum, uh, but being at the Fisk event, where again we we have 40 scholarships, um, which is an incredible amount of scholarships uh, to be able to provide to MMPS students. That is really exciting for not just our students, but also for our communities. And investing in our students is investing in Nashville. And so this is super important, not just within our own budget, whether that's fiscal or operational, it is also inside of these ongoing opportunities that bolster the growth of our city and our students and of course our staff. So I'm very excited for it, but I had the great joy of while I was there to you know, speak to several different people. But one of them said to me, you know, it's been and difficult past couple of weeks and they were saying you know it's been such a difficult past couple of weeks it's so nice to be at something exciting and I said well of course it's exciting it's us at MMPS and they said to me you know we can always count on y'all to have something good and that's because something good is happening at MMPS every day whether it is 40 scholarships at Fisk which is extraordinary or having our third early college school at Glencliff which is also extraordinary and an incredible opportunity for those students in those communities as well but there is something good happening every day, even though we don't have the chance to always recognize that inside of our awards and recognitions, though we do our, our best. We had a lot of people up here today. So I appreciate all of you being here. I appreciate the feedback that we've received about the budget. We, of course, will continue to work on that and have better conversations about what are we advocating for. To that point, I will work with Dr. Battle on us having a retreat um, so we can have a better better discussion of what we want to discuss with council, how we want to have that advocacy, what we think are the best options within those, um, the Cheesecake Factory of menu options on the, that's a big menu. I haven't been to Cheesecake Factory in a while, but I do remember it being a large menu. I was recently at Cheesecake Factory and the menu is still this thick. Just so I'm sorry, so are we ordering cheesecake? We are not. I apologize for, I apologize for getting off topic, but we do have a great number of different options that are incredibly important for not just our students, but also our staff. The board responsibility is, of course, to our students and families, but it's also to our employees. So again, I also appreciate so many of our employees showing up to our community meetings that we had in each quadrant. We really appreciate hearing your feedback, and I also appreciate the support hub and all of their work that they did, and individual students and schools with the showcases that were held beforehand. It was very good to see you, Elena, this week. But uh, we love seeing y'all. We love those showcases. They were extremely helpful in knowing more about those individual schools, especially because none of the schools happen to be any of mine inside of my district, so it helps me advocate for not just my own constituents, but MMPS as a whole. So again, I appreciate you giving us your time today. We know it's been a long one for staff, and be there no further business, this meeting is adjourned. The diver chocolate cheesecake is on I have no cheesecake. <laughs> Promise. has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.